Hello, everyone, and welcome to Washington Post Live. My name is Greg Miller. I am an investigative correspondent on the Washington Post foreign staff based in London. Uh, over the past few weeks, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the United States and its allies have imposed sanctions on Russia that go beyond anything we've ever seen targeting an economy of that size. Just yesterday, President Biden announced that the United States would ban imports on oil from Russia in just another in a series of measures meant at putting extraordinary pressure on, Ru on Russia in an attempt to persuade its leader, President Vladimir Putin, to change his decisions and calculations about the ongoing war in Ukraine. To help us make sense of these important developments, we are fortunate to have Pavel Khodorkovsky, who is the president of the Institute of Modern Russia and who is the son of one of the, who, a man who was once one of the wealthiest individuals in Russia, who spent 10 years in prison in Russia after a confrontation with Putin over corruption. Uh, so we're very pleased to have you, Pavel. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we look forward to our conversation. Greg, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this topic. Um, I very much appreciate the time because I, I'm trying to do everything I personally can to raise awareness of the war that's happening in Ukraine. Thank you, Pavel. Um, let's start, Pavel, if it's okay with you, with some of the news. So, so as I just mentioned, Biden announced a ban on oil imports yesterday. Uh, the United Kingdom has followed suit. And we're yet to see what other countries in Europe, whether they might do the same. Can you give us a sense? I mean, your father made his initial fortune in this industry in Russia. Can you give us some perspective on how this is likely to play out? Of course. So first of all, the uh, measures that were taken recently by the US administration and followed by the United Kingdom government are very important. Uh, they are very important both in terms of their symbolism and messaging that it sends to the government of Russia and particularly to President Putin, as well as in terms of their economic implications. Uh, first, the messaging. I think Putin, when deciding to wage this war uh, against the Ukrainian people and to invade Ukraine, could not have foreseen the united front that the United States and the European, its European allies will present. And certainly the ban on the imports of uh, Russian hydrocarbons uh, was unthinkable only a few weeks ago. So I think it very well um, demonstrates the type of leadership that the Western allies uh, can muster when confronted with a near existential threat. Of course, uh, there is a question of uh, the European imports. Um, if we're looking at it from the practical perspective, of course, the Russian Oil only comprise about 8% of the total imports into the US. Europe is, of course, a lot more dependent on the import of both oil and gas. But even there, we have seen very strong statements and concrete plans to wean off of the Russian uh, produced hydrocarbons uh, in just the next few years, which again was unthinkable just a few weeks ago. Pavel, do you think that, or do you worry that there might be unintended or unexpected consequences of a of a move as as aggressive as that? I mean, you just touched on the unity that we've seen across the Western world, uh, and uh, the much greater dependence that countries in Europe, including Germany, have on on Russian gas and oil. I mean, it, there will be ramifications for people all over the world as a result of this. And I wonder who you think might be sort of the winners and losers. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry. It looks like we're having some.
Sorry about that. I think the connection broke. That's OK, Pavel. Did you hear my question? Should I can I help yeah. you by repeating? So the question okay. was well, about the unintended consequences. If I understood it correctly. Yes, exactly. Uh, so first of all, the unintended consequences, uh, of course, are the impact that this is going to have on the trajectory of um, Russia's economy over the next few decades. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that at this point in time. And obviously, the victims of that rapid change in direction will be the Russian people, uh, including those which, um, if not the majority, uh, at least a healthy proportion of the Russian population, uh, including those that are against the war in Ukraine. Obviously, the standards of living uh, have already uh, started to deteriorate. Uh, given the uh, foreign exchange uh, rapid uh, swings and the devaluation of uh, rubble. Uh, but it also affects uh, people's everyday lives in terms of food imports, consumer dur durables, etc. But I think the bigger question uh, in terms of the unintended consequences is the perception of Russian people uh, in the world. That's the type of stain that will be impossible, inconceivable to wash off, uh, at least for my generation. We'll never be able to tell or explain to new people that I meet uh, in any other country uh, around the world that I'm not that Russian that has attacked Ukraine. I, I want to circle back to that point uh, and toward the end of the program. Let's stick with the, the oil for one more question, if you don't mind, Pavel. Uh, Biden has has warned the American public that gas prices are going to rise and could rise significantly in the United States. I mean, how do you convey the message that that whatever uh, that this price is worth it, if, if indeed you think it is? I think early on uh, at the onset of this war in Ukraine, the United States um, thought that it could distance itself or maybe isolate itself uh, from this conflict. And I think that's a mistake. What's at stake in Europe right now is more than simply the lives and liberties of the Ukrainian people. They are the ones paying the cost with their blood, but what they're defending is more than their life and freedom. They're also defending the rest of the Europe and the democratic values against those values of autocracy, if such can be said uh, about autocratic, despotic regimes, such as the one of Vladimir Putin in Russia. They're acting as live shield for the rest of the world right now. So I think the people in the United States are starting to see that. They're starting to understand that the fight in the Ukraine is more than just a regional conflict. and as we've seen in some of the polling, the people in the US, even though they're seeing higher gas prices, uh, are willing to make that economic sacrifice to fight for democracy. Yeah, very good point. Uh, Pavel, can we step back for a bit here? I would like to ask you to explain to our audience just a bit about your background and your father's background. Can you tell us about the case that was brought against him and your family's history in Russia? I mean, in a brief in a brief way. I apologize. Uh, and I would also mention that you know, you and I, in a in a conversation offline, you talked about your family's connections to Ukraine as well. And I think our viewers would be really interested in hearing a bit about that. Of course. Well, in terms of my father's uh, story of confrontation was uh, Vladimir Putin. Thankfully, um, that's in the past, although there are still people uh, that worked at Yukos, the company that my uh, father uh, has grown uh, to one of the leading oil producers uh, in Russia. Uh, some of them are still imprisoned or unable to leave uh, for fear of persecution. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, my father uh, was one of the more successful businessmen uh, in Russia. And at the beginning of the period of economic transition uh, from communism to uh, liberalized economy, 
uh, he was able to build up first a, a commercial bank and then um, rebuild an oil company called Yukos, which uh, he has managed to uh, put uh, on par with some of the largest producers of oil in the world in just a few years. Um, <clears throat> his confrontation with Putin centered on corruption and the ability of business to support civil society. My father was on one side of that argument and Vladimir Putin was on the other. Unfortunately for my dad, uh, back in October 2003, Putin decided that he will crack down on all dissent, starting um, with the people who have the most economic um, power. So my father went uh, went to prison on trumped up charges of tax evasion and fraud. Um, his company was broken up and sold to the state-owned oil giant Rosneft. In terms of our family history, um, my father's uh, family is actually originally from Ukraine. Uh, both his uh, maternal and paternal grandparents are from Ukraine. One of them was from Kharkiv, the other one was from Rutomir. So the conflict that's happening right now in Ukraine is very close and dear to our family. Uh, simply because we still have relatives that live there. My cousin is in Viv, um, and a lot of my friends are actually in uh, Ukraine right now. I I went to school uh, with a dear friend of mine from Dnepropetrovsk. Uh, it's in the center east of Ukraine. I have gone there uh, on my summer breaks and Christmas breaks when I was back in college, and I've uh, met a lot of people who became my very good friends. A lot of them are still back there. Two of the friends that I've uh, known for more than 18 years are in Kiev right now, uh, hiding in a basement from the airstrikes. Another one of my friends has uh, driven his uh, family to the border. They successfully crossed. He came back uh, to Lviv, and he's helping to organize humanitarian aid to um, the besieged cities in the east of the country. It's remarkable how many Russians have similar connections across that border. And also, uh, I've been fascinated by some of the reporting in recent days about just uh, the different, um, the sort of reality, the warped realities across that border as well in terms of uh, relatives in Ukraine who are witnessing the horror of this conflict and in touch with relatives in Russia who were, seem oblivious to the carnage because of the constraints on information in Russia. Have you had conversations with your father about what's happening? Can you tell us anything about what, what he has said and what you guys have talked about? We've been talking with my father every day, uh, trying to coordinate whatever we can do, whatever it's in our uh, ability to somehow stop this war. And that that means, you know, talking to the talking to the media, raising awareness about the case and also helping in terms of uh, you know sending humanitarian aid uh, to Ukraine. Our conversations are conversations with him though are primarily about how that's going to affect the future uh, of our country. Obviously what's uh, the war that's that's brought its horrors to Ukraine is uh, the immediate catastrophe that, that needs to be stopped right now. And we're also thinking about the long-term disaster that it has brought on Russia, both in terms of the, the economy, which has been thrust back to the middle of the 20th century, if not further, uh, and in terms of the perception of uh, the Russian people in the world. I want to I want to pause on a, a phrase you just used there. You you just mentioned in your conversation with your father. You talk about our country. Here I, I think you're at the moment in the United States. I believe your father is is based in London, and I don't know whether he has been back to Russia. I, I would I would expect otherwise for for many many years. But you still see it as your country. You both still have some attachment to it, some some concern for its future. Of course, and it's not because I'm trying to sound, you know, pompous for 
no reason. We really do feel that way. We we still have families back there. Uh, a lot of my friends are back in Russia. Um, unfortunately, with some of them, you know, we've uh, we've had very recently serious disagreements on what's what's happening. Um, but I do feel that 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 Russia is still very much my country, although I have been and I realize extremely lucky and privileged to be living in the United States, given what's 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 going on right now. What kind of disagreements? Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Pavel? I think that's really interesting. Um, what what are you disagreeing about? We're uh, we're arguing about what can be done right now, and my position and that of my father is very simple: that the only way how the Russian people can begin to atone for the sin of the government is by going to the street, protesting the war, in effect opening the second front for Putin back home. Every every single protest in Russia right now is dragging away the attention of the government to try and control the situation domestically. And it's literally saving saving lives of people in Ukraine. I don't think fully, uh, I don't think that people fully realize that uh, back in Russia. And it's understandable, but I think that point needs needs to be made. It's understandable because they have a lot to lose. You know, people of uh, my generation, I'm 36 years old. You know, they have they have a family, they have kids, they some of them have businesses. They see that their well-being is crumbling from the war uh, as a result of sanctions, and yet they don't see a an opportunity to change anything and i just want to say to those people that in part it's due to their inaction in the last 10 years that the situation has gone as far as russians killing ukrainians and invading the country yeah i mean that's it's it's hard to wrap your head around that point but you're you're, you're right that for many Russians, perhaps many of those who are in the position uh, to do the most or also perhaps have the most to lose. Uh, and, and it must be terribly disorienting uh, for, for millions of Russians right now to try to sort out uh, what's happening and what's coming, especially given the dearth of accurate information available. So, you know, when we, when you, we talk about the history of your family and your father's encounter and kind of showdown with Putin, it really, you know, there are echoes of it even now because he was to some uh, one of the original oligarchs and he tried to stand up to Putin uh, over issues of corruption and paid a terrible price personally. I mean, one of the points of the sanctions that the United States and other countries are imposing now is to try to force or coerce other oligarchs close to Putin to do something like that, to get in his ear, to convince him to change his mind. Is that is that a reasonable expectation? Can you talk to us about what uh, whether oligarchs even function as influencers given the political environment in Russia now? So first, the personal sanctions against oligarchs, the let's call them the new generation of oligarchs uh, that are closely associated with the president himself, presidential administration. Um, those sanctions are inc incredibly important. Why? Because they are stemming the flow of capital back to Russia that at this point can and will be used to finance the slaughter of Ukrainian people, to finance the war. However, in terms of oligarchs' personal um, influence over Putin, I think that's that's a misconception. There is none. Putin views them as wallets, as a means to an end. So although the sanctions are important and effective in terms of um, the capital implications, I think the idea that somehow they can be pressured to overthrow the government from within or to lobby Putin to stop the war 
I think that's that's a mis misconception. As a reporter who has covered um, the the flow of Russian money into offshore accounts, into tax havens, into shell companies, I mean, it is a daunting undertaking to try to to try to identify and locate those sorts of assets. I mean, can you talk about how uh, you know, sort of the difficulty of 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 imposing these sanctions and executing these sanctions, and whether you whether there are ways that the United States and its allies in Europe can be more effective as they go about this? It is a daunting task, but I think it's a question of political will, both in Europe and in the United States. I think that the uh, the intelligence uh, community is very well informed of the movement of capital uh, from Russia into those offshore zones that you've uh, mentioned. And I think nothing has been done up up until two weeks ago, um, simply because there was there was no political will uh, to oppose uh, Russia um, in those terms. Of course, we've, we've we've seen very effective sanctions for people that have been um, directly implicated in corruption and human rights abuses. I'm talking right now about the Magnitsky Act that was passed initially in the United States Congress and later on adopted in other forms throughout the uh, rest of the uh, European countries and uh, Canada. The, uh, uh, the implications of um, you know, uncovering those assets, uh, of course, are, you know, they're, they're going to take effort and they're going to take time. Uh, but I think it's it's uh, nevertheless a very important uh, signal to um, perhaps the next generation of oligarchs that uh, their actions matter and they will not be accepted uh, in the West uh, if they align themselves with uh, an autocratic or despotic regime. Now, that would represent uh, a significant and substantial turnabout from the signal that the West has sent for, for many years, I think. Uh, it, it will be interesting to watch that play out. Pavel, can we circle back to an idea that you were raising at the start of our program uh, today, which was, I think you were, you were sort of touching on the idea um, that, you know, there are obviously millions of Russians who do not support this war. There, is, there are upcoming generations of Russians, and you are among them, uh, you know, in your teens or 20s or 30s, for whom there is a long future ahead. Uh, are there risks to the global backlash against Russia now? Is Do we risk... Um, uh, isolating those people who have, are the potential reformers uh, of the future, do we risk making turning them against the West because of the pain that is about to be inflicted on their country and on their lives? Yes, and it's a, it's a knife's edge situation. You want to put enough pressure on um, the government to stop the war, to stop the killing of innocent people, but you also don't want to alienate the society to the point where it will perceive the economic sanctions as an attack um, on the country. So if there was ever a time for both the European countries and the United States and Canada to increase the flow of qualified um, immigration, um, the time is now because those are, and that would achieve two uh, two goals. First of all, it would give people access to the uh, education system in the West. It would give them access to unbiased uh, information that's free of Russian uh, propaganda. And it will take away uh, resources from the Russian government uh, in terms of the human capital. And that human capital can be used in further fortifying the military resources of the country, which, as we have seen, are not intended for defense. They are intended for offense. And one other thing I wanted to come back to um, that I haven't answered in your previous question is what else, uh, what else can be done uh, in terms of economic pressure? I think um, 
the distinction that's being made right now uh, between the banks that are con directly controlled by the Russian government uh, versus the banks in Russia that are only commercial uh, is, again, a misconception presently. Every single bank that's operating in Russia can and will be used as a wallet to fund the war in Ukraine. So I think the economic sanctions on Russian banks should be all-encompassing at this point in time. Pavel, I want to tell you that I, this is a fascinating conversation. Uh, we could go on, and and I wish we could. We are we have run up against our time limit for this program today. I want to thank you so much uh, for your participation and for the insights that you've shared. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for inviting me. And to our audience, thank you also for joining us. To find out, I'm Greg Miller from the Washington Post Foreign Staff. To find out more about upcoming programs like this, visit us at WashingtonPostLive.com. Thanks very much.